Welcome into our Cubs recap podcast here on our YouTube channel and available audio only anywhere you get your podcasts with my partner, Gordon Wittenmeyer. I'm David Kaplan, and what an honor it is to have a guy I got to know when he was with the Cubs coaching and now doing a great job with the Baltimore Orioles, one of the best teams in baseball, Brandon Hyde, their great manager. Brandon, thank you for taking time to navigate all you had to deal with from the day you got hired as the manager to where you see your team today. What are your emotions like about looking at this club in the second half coming up? Yeah, well, I'm proud of the start we're, you know, we're on right now and, and how we played so far this year. You know, we played pretty good baseball here since May of last year. And um, it was a tough few years, you know, just like in Chicago those days, there was, it was a tough few years there. Um, but we've gotten a lot more talented and our front office done a great job of drafting and they've made some good pro decisions and uh, just like how our team has come together. Honestly, I think we're an exciting team to watch. Uh, I you know it's, it's a lot of homegrown guys right now and uh, sprinkled in with some good veteran players and, and uh, we're off to a good start. Yeah, it's crazy. We talk about you and I talked when you came into Chicago last year, when you were starting to make noise and people were starting to pick up on what you guys had going on, uh, just young talent everywhere. And I think Rutschman had just come up. Mm-hmm. Now all of a sudden we see these other guys. Mm-hmm. Gunnar Henderson, Grayson Rodriguez was up for a while. Yep. He's back down. Jordan Westberg came up when uh, the Reds were in there. Uh, mm-hmm. I saw him uh, debut for you guys. And, and who's this new guy, Colton Kowser? Yeah, Colton Kowser was a first round pick a couple years ago out of college. Really talented player also. So, yeah, no, it's, you know, things changed a little bit, you know, a lot when Natalie got here. And um, Adley was Mike's first pick and the one, one pick of that 2019 draft. And, um, you know, had it was kind of a celebrated college career and it's kind of a consensus number one guy at that time. And, and he's come here and played extremely well and changed, helped change the culture here um, of just, you know, a winning attitude, a guy that, you know, it's in from being behind the plate also being our division uh, we just really struggled pitching and pitching to these type of lineups in the America League East. And uh, Adley helped change that, honestly, be behind the plate, helping these guys out, and, and he can really hit, too. So a lot of talented guys here right now. There's more coming, too. I mean, if you look at the Futures game, Jackson Holiday, Matt Holiday's son. That's right, he's yeah. He's to a huge start in high age, only 19. we got Heston Kierstad was the number two pick in 2020. He's killing it in AAA right now also offensively, and there's more. So – uh, they've, they've done an amazing job drafting hitters and I, all these, and all these guys are hitting in the minor leagues too. It's not just, not just kind of hype. It's these guys are producing in the minor leagues and putting up massive numbers. And, and uh, so that's, that's you know, organizations really healthy right now. Man, Let me I, ask you this question, Brandon, because I remember a couple of executives saying to me, there really are no bad plans in major league baseball. It is the impatience of the people above the front office and the field manager and his staff from staying loyal to said plan. So, ah, we didn't win for two years. Change this. Ah, we didn't win that year. Change that. He said, if you really stay loyal and believe in your plan and your people, you will eventually be rewarded. The Baltimore Orioles are a perfect example of we're going to set a direction Yes, we may have some growing pains along the way, but if we do our job properly, we're going to be rewarded. How does an organization not only make that determination, but stick to it? Yeah, that, that, that's, a great, that's a great way to say it, honestly. Well, Mike Elias came from Houston, and he had already been through it. He'd already kind of seen the process and, and them not being, them being bad for a few years and staying kind of true to – drafting correctly, um, having patience with players, putting together the right player development system. And that was really his focus the first few years. I'll be 100% honest, he was way more patient than I was. Now I'm living it every night and having to answer why we stink and all these things on a nightly basis, and that's hard to do. And that took a lot of support. (laughs) I had a lot of support around me, honestly, um, with some good friends on the coaching staff that people kind of, you know, him, honestly, him, him, him. being very, very realistic with, listen, we're just not as talented as these other teams, and there's nothing you can do about it. Because I would take it hard, and it'd be hard. For, it'd be hard on a nightly basis. The way the, the way the Yankees and the Blue Jays and the Red Sox and 
you know, the Rays, these teams were, were playing them half the t- half our games. It, it was we were overmatched in a lot of in a lot of nights, and and so that was that was tough to swallow. So him just being more patient than me, honestly, during that time and having patience with me to kind of grow also, I think I really appreciate and, and look back on those days and have a lot of respect for him for that. Yeah, I'm going to, with, I mean, with serious respect for what you've accomplished there with those young players, especially in that division, I'm going to push back a little bit on your executive cap because you stick long enough with a plan, things cycle in sports. I mean, of course, it's going to come around. I mean, Pittsburgh eventually won. Took 20 years, but they stuck to their plan, trading guys all the time as soon as they got expensive. I mean, the, th- the thing is, especially when, you know, we, and we've seen this 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 idea of, like, stripping it all down. That's actually that's an easy way to get a lot of talent. What's not easy is what you're doing, Brandon, is, is when the time comes, getting something out of these guys. And, and uh, having as much success percentage-wise like a lot of these guys have hit if not damn near all of them and and it's what's most impressive to me is you alluded to it how do you do that in that division of all divisions I think last time I looked every team in that division this year was 500 or better and it was damn near that last year when you guys started breaking through yeah I think I read something yesterday I think in the last 162 games we won 97 so over the you know, the last baseball calendar, we've won almost a hundred, hundred win team at this point. And how we do it, I, I just try to be as consistent as possible. I think we have a really good coaching staff. I think we have a great environment in our clubhouse. I think a lot of people say that, but I do believe that we do and that there's a, it's a relaxed atmosphere. Um, try not to get too high, try not to get too low. You're just focused on the night's game and kind of the process of being, you know, doing the right things on a nightly basis and a lot of coaching. I mean, a lot of coaching at the major league level. Uh, people think that you roll the balls out there with major league players. That's not the case at all. There's, there's a, uh, especially with the way we are right now, we are, we're getting guys to the big leagues kind of quick. And so there's still so much teaching going on on a nightly basis. So you got to have really good coaches around you that care, uh, that care about players, care about the, the people, um, and they kind of, if you set that environment with, with good people around you uh, and that are super competitive also, and they want, that, that want to win and it matters, um, you know, we are where we are. So I'm just, you know, proud of all that, kind of proud of how far we've come. And, and um, yeah, now we're in Minnesota and we're trying to, trying to win a series before the break. Hey, so, can, I, can I ask just one follow-up to, to that? With all these young players that have come up and in the, another one behind – the last one and then another one and then another one. Um, and they're m- making it happen like out of the shoot. I'm seeing a little bit of that in Cincinnati. Uh, maybe, maybe a lot of it, you know, we'll mm-hmm. see, we'll see where that goes. And I've seen it with some other teams in the past, uh, but not as often. It seems like there's more of these now are, I don't know if you can quantify this has, what's your observation on some of the younger talented players today is whether it's their generation, whether it's them individually or changes in the game, are they better equipped to succeed more quickly than maybe past generations for whatever reason? Uh, I think offensively. Yes. Um, that's what I'm seeing with young hitters right now. Cincinnati's incredibly impressive. Uh, as you saw, I saw you a week ago or so and we mm-hmm. played them. And that's, that is a, there's a lot of really good young hitters in that lineup that, are pretty advanced. Some of the young guys we have, Gunnar Henderson's just turned 22, really obviously advanced for 22. But I saw him when you got drafted too out of high school, and there's been a lot of changes. Our player development system has done a great, really good job of, of training these guys to hit elite pitching. And and being to hit elite pitching is so hard to do. You really have to train to hit. And I, and I think that the training of the way that people are training offensively now is better than ever before. Um, I think we've gone out of the launch angle age and more into the trying to drive the ball hard through the middle of the field, understanding there's a lot of, a lot of nuances, but they're training to hit elite pitching now instead of just old school batting practice. There's a lot of different things that people are doing to, to help, to help um, train. And also the physicality of this sport too. The guys are in great shape. And guys are super strong at a young age and more than ever before. So when I look at that Cincinnati team, fast, strong, um, unbelievably athletic, but really short, 
really good swings. And that's, I feel like that's what our guys are, are coming up with, too. You look at Arizona, it's the same thing. Unbelievably fast, unbelievably strong, um, trained well to hit tough pitching. And that's that's a change that I've seen here the last couple of years. With, there's, a, there's a lot of really good young hitters in this league. So take me back 20, going into 15 in Chicago. And those of us who were around you and Joe and the team every day, Gordon was there. Boy, there's some talent coming. Like you knew. And the last month or six weeks of 14, we went, that team's got something cooking there. Mm -hmm. 15, here's Joe and here's this. And here's, and all of a sudden, uh-oh, that team's really freaking good. So take me from 15 through the night you won the World Series, November 2nd in 2016. Like, did you see this rise coming or ah, I still wasn't sure? Well, at the end of 14, we were a lot more fun to watch. And that's, yes. that's you know, Baez, Soler, Kyle Hendricks, Alcantara. Remember Al Alcantara? All of a sudden, we got really athletic on the field. Our back end of the bullpen with Strope and Rondon kind of came into their own also. So we were starting to win games uh, that we were ahead, had the lead late. But we were away, you know. Javi was swinging out of his shoes, but he might go deep or he might punch out. Soler was becoming a dude at that point. Um, the farm system, you know, Theo and Jason, J-Mac and Jed, Shiraz, Scott Harris, these guys, they drafted really well. Um, there was, I think we became the number one farm system at some point, 14, where um, all of a sudden we started getting a bunch of really good hitters. It's very similar to this. And uh, they make a trade for Addison mm -hmm. Russell. Uh, all of a sudden, we got shortstops that Eloy Jimenez is down in A ball. Gleyber Torres is down in A ball. Um, so all of a sudden, we have shortstops all the way down through the system. You go into 15 with some momentum, and then you sign John Lester, and then you get Dexter Fowler, and you get Miguel Montero, and the, the, the culture, and obviously Joe. Joe's a huge piece of that. Um, the culture completely changed just that spring in 15. Um, there was an expectation to win. Joe brought an expectation to win. John Lester, there was a refusal to lose. Um, you know, Dexter was going to play. Miguel Montero had an edge. So all of a sudden, we got a little bit more talented. Well, we got way more talented, but then we had an edge. Bryant was in spring training in 15. I think he hit 10 homers in spring. They sent him out at the end of camp. That was a big story. Yep. But all of a sudden, yep. the second week of the season, here comes, you know, we got a pretty talented team, we feel like, uh, with Jake Arrieta coming into his own two at the end of 14. Um, and then here comes Bryant and Russell that second week. And all of a sudden we got really athletic on the field. We got John Lester and Hendricks and Arietta going three out of the five days. Don't forget Jason Hamill. Um, and we just start to win. You know, you start to win and you start to, well, I think we won 97 games that year. So I think the right. I, Theo and his group did an amazing job of surrounding those young, talented players with, Awesome veteran guys. That's what I, I, I go back to in those 15, 16 years. We had amazing, crusty, edgy veterans that really helped out Javi, Addison, Rizzo, Bryant, Schwarber. Um, they really brought those guys, Contreras in 16. They really brought those guys along and because they, were, they really held them accountable. Lester, Lackey. I remember Chris DeNorfia was really good. Uh, Miguel Montero. Um then, 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 then Zobers. Then Zobers changed the whole lineup in '16. So there, there was, a, there was just a great mix. We had a great mix, a blend. The guys really liked each other. Um, they pulled for each other. They got on each other. It was, a, and they were, and they had a hell of a lot of fun. We had so much fun in '15 and '16 um, that it was just a great time. It was one of the, you know, great, greatest experiences of my life, and the funnest time of my life. Would you have believed at the time? In the, in, the, in the aftermath of that championship with one of the youngest lineups in World Series history that six, seven years later, everybody but Kyle Hendricks would be gone from that team. I know. That was weird, honestly, just going to Wrigley just the last couple weeks, uh, a couple weeks ago. And uh, that was somebody told me that that, that 16 team, Kyle was, a, was, was the last one standing. And, um, crazy. Crazy, yeah. Yeah, you know, well, Ro let's let's give Rossi credit. Rossi was there, um, yep. and that's a player. But Rossi was so impactful too. Those two years, huge. Just refusal to lose. Pissed when we lost. Not accepting bad baseball. Um, openly, 
And that really was helpful. He was another coach on the field and coach in the, in the clubhouse. But that, that is strange that there's only one player left. Um, I don't know many people over there on the, on the field anymore, Hadavi and Ian Happ. But, but uh, yeah, that was different. Let me ask you this because Rizzo told me a story that he didn't hustle a ball out going to Pittsburgh one day. He said, I got back to the dugout. He goes, the guy I'm closest to and I idolize is David Ross. And he pushes him up against the dugout wall and said, we don't do that here. That will never happen again. Am I clear? He said, and it was colorful. It was profane. And it was needed. How do you as a manager empower your veterans to do something like that knowing – it's going to ruffle some feathers, but it's important and it builds culture. Well, it means way more, means way more when your peers doing it. And so as a coach, I love the, I love when players uh, hold each other accountable. That's what I want. You want the guy next to you in, your, in the locker room to hold, to hold each other accountable. And I talk about it. I, I want them to coach each other um, because the, there's it just – these guys are going to battle together. Coaches, we are directing and we are setting a culture and we are helping in, in a lot of ways. But it's a player's game. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Joe did that. Joe allowed guys to be, to, do, to be free and to be themselves and to really coach each other. And that was, that's a huge part. And that's when, when, you know, people can say what they want about John Lackey. Lack. Lack was unbelievable at uh, not caring and t- and saying what is right all the time. He's going to say what he's, he's going to say what he thinks. He's going to say what's right. It doesn't matter who it is. And so when there was, some, was there wasn't a play being made behind him or something, or he wasn't pitching, and something right wasn't happening, he was going to say it. And we had a we had a group of guys like that. And that's when for me, that's when things start to change. Is when the guys aren't uh, accepting bad baseball. Yeah, Lackey did that publicly. He called out guys publicly after the game. That neat play needs to be made behind me. As he should. I mean, he's like, you know what? He wants to win, and, and that mattered to him. And, and he didn't he didn't care. Uh, he wasn't coming. What did he say? He wasn't coming for a shave and a haircut or something? <laughs> yeah. um, I didn't come here for a haircut. I, I, didn't, yeah. I came here for jewelry. I didn't come to get a yeah. haircut. I came yeah. to get jewelry. One of the greatest, greatest teammates of all. One of the greatest teammates of all time. Love him. Stand. I was so scared to death. I did the outfield positioning during those 50, those years. And if a ball dropped in front of Schwarber or in front of Soler, I was so scared when he came back into the dugout that I was going to get yelled at. Um, <laughs> I didn't have the outfielder in the right spot. So, man, I was on – him and Lester, I was on my toes. Everybody was on their toes when they were on the mound because you want to make sure that, they, that they, everybody was in the right spot. Man. Hey, wait, but you've seen um... – I think you guys have seen four of the five teams in the NL Central this year. Um, what do you What do you make of uh, your old division right now? And and who who do you like? Who do you don't? Who do you not like? As we go, what the last eight seventy five games or whatever it is. Well, I wish we would have played them better. We have not played this National League Central very well, and, and that's been disappointing <laughs> because we have played most other divisions very well. It's crazy because it's such a crap division. Well. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not sold on that. Cincinnati's the real deal, and uh, that is a tough lineup to pitch against, and a really athletic, fun team. And I think that that's. I think they're they're going to make a lot of noise in the second half. I think the Cubs are better than people think. Um, I think that they have a chance to pitch. We'll see what happens after the deadline. But if you run into Stroman and Hendricks. Uh, and Steele, that's a tough three. That's a very, very tough three game series. Tyon pitched well against us. I mean, that's, 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 a, and then Azalea at the end. Uh, the lineup's athletic. There's guys that can go deep on you. So I think they were, they were a better team than people think. Milwaukee, you could run, run into Corbin Burns, which we did. He shut us down. Um, I know he's not having the same year as he has before, but that they've, they've always had good starting pitching. Uh, so I don't know. I think that, uh, we haven't played the division very well, but Cincinnati was really, really impressive to me uh, last week. I want to ask you about getting kicked out of a game up 14 runs. And you said, weirdest ejection of my life. Yeah. Did you see that coming? It wasn't my best moment, probably. Um, I, you know, we got, we had one up by our head and when we got, and then we got drilled up, up 14 and, 
at that point they're going to put a warning out. I, I, I didn't go out to get ejected. I just went out to, to say, if you're going to put a warning out, why aren't you just throwing them out of the game? If it's, this is deemed a warning, why isn't it just an ejection? If, if now is the time, um, and I guess you can't argue warnings anymore. I didn't even know that. So in arguing a warning, which I guess I was doing by walking out there, is an automatic ejection. So that was not uh, that was not planned or anything. I was just asking, well, how come you just didn't toss them out of the game if there was a warning going to be put out at that point? Have That's you a ever had move. a moment, Brandon, where you're managing, maybe it's a tough season as you're building, and you're like, you know what, I've watched enough. Kick me out of here. And gone out and gotten kicked out? Happened once, yeah. <laughs> Tell yeah, us that. I just didn't want to watch it anymore. Yeah, I had enough. Team was <laughs> team was playing. We were not good, and team was playing terrible. And and I was just, I, I was just, I did uh-huh. things weren't going our way, and I just it was that was it was time. <laughs> yeah, it's happened. Pretty good. Pretty good. Do you say to the umpire, "Hey, kick me out"? I think I did on that point. I said, "I'm not leaving here until you throw me out" or something like that. So yeah, <laughs> that was that was a, a pretty much. I pretty much asked for it. So that's the best. <laughs> Were there moments in your career? You're a family guy. Baseball life is a tough life. I was reading an article. Mike Malone, who just won the NBA title, said I was cleaning bathrooms and locker rooms noon to or midnight to four a.m. I was working part time at a finish line shoe store, and I was making very little money coaching. I went, I can't do this. I just can't do it anymore. And then his phone rang and he got an, another opportunity and it paid better and he stuck with it. He said, now here I am, I'm making millions of dollars and I'm the NBA champ. He said, I would have never believed it. Were there ever moments in your grind where you went, oh boy, I, I want to raise my kids. I don't know if I can do this or you never lost faith. No, there's definitely times where you lose faith. And that was, I spent four years in the South Atlantic league, 2003 to 2000 through six. I was in the South Atlantic league, four years on the buses of that league, two years in the Southern league. When you're in the middle of the night, uh, 14 hour trips from Jacksonville to West 10, those thoughts come up. And when you're sitting, your wife's at home with, with with babies and um, you're making nothing and you're getting $20 meal money and you're wondering what, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of moments. I'll be honest with you. I got offered a couple college coaching jobs while I've been on the road, um, grinding it out in the minor leagues. Uh, I didn't take them, but there was I was definitely considering a lifestyle change. I put I out of out of when I coached at Long Beach State when I was 29 years old, done playing. I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. I I was applying at police station, so I applied at LAPD, Long Beach Police oh, wow. Department, LA Sheriff. Um, and then all of a sudden the Marlins called to have me coach and to make nothing as an A ball hitting coach. So there's been a lot of things. I mean, I was bartending, not making any money coaching as a grad, a grad school or grad, was it undergrad? A grad uh, assistant. Yeah. Yeah. 30 years old. I had done playing and I had no money and I was just trying to figure out what I was going to do, graduate. And then I was bartending, doing lessons, doing all kinds of stuff. And then the Marlins called and offered me an A ball hitting coach job. So. Uh, I've been fortunate that I've gotten a lot of breaks, and I'm fortunate that I've had been surrounded by a lot of people that have kept me going and and uh, believed in me and promoted me. And um, but but it's 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 always it's always everybody's got a tough road, and there's always things that you have to you have to get through, and sometimes you have to get a little bit lucky. And and uh, but I feel fortunate where I am now. Yeah, I was I was gonna say, man. After all that, what must this season be mean to you? You know, you got you guys are. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say it. You. I know you got a lot, a lot of months to play here, but you guys are headed to the playoffs, man, and uh, you, you might have the team to make some noise there. What does a season like that mean to you? Well, we got a long, we got a long way to go, and we we got a real tough schedule ahead, and we got, you know, there's a lot of things that can happen. So you still have to catch, you still have to get lucky and catch some breaks and play well for sure. Uh, but it does mean a lot. There's no doubt, I and mean, especially kind of what I went through here from 19, 20, 21. Um, and the years that we had there and, and how hard that was on a nightly basis. Uh, I want to, I do, I you know what I'm more happy for. I'm more happy for the guys that were here during those years, the players, the Austin Hayes, Santander's um, those type of Mullins, like those type of guys that saw this at its worst and, and went out there and busted their butt to being down nine to one in the sixth inning all the time in the American league East um, to, for them to kind of get over this hump also, you know, 
said a 30-30 guy two years ago, all-star starter. Austin Hayes going to the all-star game. We got four guys going to the all-star game. Those are the things I'm the, I'm the happiest about when I, you know, I look in the clubhouse, I see those guys and know what that was like three, four years ago. Uh, that's what means the most to me right now. They going to get you some help at the deadline? We'll see. We'll see. You got to email Mike, maybe. Yeah, I'll, hey. I'll, I'll, I'll ask him. <laughs> Before we let you go, and it's so great to talk to you, Brandon, the night of Game 7, I ran into Ben Zobrist that day at the Starbucks in Cleveland. Hey, man, good luck tonight. How you doing? <laughs> and he's like, I'm nervous. He said, you could either be the GOAT tonight, you could go home and have the greatest night of your life. Then I run into Theo. I said, hey, good luck, man. Because Theo had said to me, like, in 2014, I'm like, dude, is this ever going to happen? He said, little advice. You need to lose a little weight. I would start working out and hope you live a little bit longer. It's going to take some time. So uh, Zobris says to me, when that home run off Rajay Davis's bat flew over my head, I went, oh, my God, the, the goat thing is the, for real. So take me back to that moment and then the rest of the night. Well, I just ran into Rajay in New York, and I, I every time I see him, I tell him, you gave me the worst 10 seconds of my life. Worst. I mean, just the worst feeling possible <laughs> when he hit that ball. Oh. So that during that moment, I was so nervous because I felt like our outfield was too deep. So Rajay Davis against Chapman, and all I'm thinking is Jay Hayes too deep. And I got uh, – I remember Hamill was next to me, I think Hinsky, and I was like – I think, I think Jay is too deep. He's going to jam one. It's going to bloop in. And the next thing you know, he, he goes deep. It, like You couldn't hear a word in our dugout. Obviously, the place was going nuts, but it was the worst feeling in the world. Um, just the, this empty pit in your stomach. Awful. And then the rain, you know, the famous thing. People don't give Chappie enough credit for getting out of that next inning. He did. The next inning was the biggest inning and Kipnis almost went deep, but it went far. And I, talked, and I just saw Kipnis too. And I just, <laughs> yeah, but that next inning to get through that next inning after that heartbreak, that yeah. shows you the kind of character that Chappie has and how awesome. And I love that guy. Uh, yeah. Also he was about toast by then physically. Yeah. I mean, just on fumes, everybody at that time is, up, you know, obviously him because of what he, what he had done up to that point and, and really carried us to the back end of the games up until that point. But him to go out that next inning against the middle of the order. People don't give him enough credit for that. Then the rain came. You could have heard a pin drop in our coach's room. We thought it was going to be a while. That was the, the thing. I was like, they told us that we were going to be a while. And next thing you know, it's like 20 minutes later. I didn't know that meeting was going on in the weight room. I was in the coach's room just sitting there sulking, sucking my thumb with the other coaches. And then all of a sudden, we're back out playing, and you just hear this. You just hear our dugout. Our dugout, our, our players picked the coaches up. I'll tell you that right now. Because we were not rah-rah. It was we – were, we were in the dumps. It was the players, Schwarber, uh, yelling that we're not going to lose this game. These guys, it was amazing. It was amazing the energy out after the rain delay and Schwab getting that hit right away. And you, I said, saw the video the other day, see my face. I'm so relieved. Um, and that just kind of got it going and the momentum of that. And that night, I mean, that was a blurred night. There was the, uh, my family's on the field, you know, the whole thing. And then the Bill Murray's champagne on my son's head in the clubhouse and uh, wild, wild. And the cool, you know, the, I don't even know what time we got back to Chicago, but the, uh, the fire station in Chicago at the airport when they had, had all the, 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 the water going with the, yeah. the whole thing. And then the people lined up on, on, uh, on the highway there. It was from, to your family to see that. And now it's morning, um, you know, a special day for sure. When did you know about the meet? When did you find out there had been a meeting that Jay Hay and some other guys spoke with Jay Hay orchestrated the whole thing? When did you find that out? Uh, I asked, well, when we came back in the dugout, there was a ton of energy. And so I, I, I think I, I don't remember who I asked, but it was, it might've been La Stella or somebody like that. I said, I said, uh, what happened? And he said, we just had a meeting in the, in the weight room. And that's when I found, that's what I found out. I didn't know that, but I didn't know that was happening at the time. That meeting was the greatest meeting ever held. <laughs> Best meeting ever. The greatest, <laughs> ever. Meeting, the greatest meeting of all time. It is. <laughs> Hey, man, we appreciate you taking time for us. Just know there are a lot of us who got to know you that are rooting for you. 
Oh, man. Thank yeah. you so much. I appreciate having me on. It's great to see you guys. And, and uh, yeah, it's always fun going back to Chicago. I miss it deeply, the area and, and Wrigley Field. And um, so, thanks for having me on. You bet. All, All the right, best. Man. Good luck on the stretch, man. All right. Thank you.